Welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life. Today I want to share with you about trust. You know, when we learn to trust God completely, it allows us to go ahead and just enjoy our lives even while we don't yet have everything we would like to have. Ginger's going to join me with some of your questions on trust. But right now, be encouraged by today's teaching as we discover what real trust is. Let's talk about reasoning for a minute. How many of you have the kind of mind where you just like to figure things out? Well, I have to admit I do too. You know, my favorite types of movies are mysteries. I honestly think if I wouldn't have been a preacher, I could have been a detective. <laughs> Seriously, it's like I just love to figure it out. I love the surprise and, and the mystery of it. And so it's hard for me not to get into trying to figure out why this happened and why that happened and why something else happened. And, you know, I, I had the privilege of being part of what is known as the Word and Faith Movement. And I'd been a Christian for a long time, but there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the church and a lot of, just a lot of teaching about faith and a, a lot of teaching about healing. And, you know, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful time. But I also want to tell you, and I do it respectfully, some of the truths that were being taught were taken to such an extreme that they then began to be a problem. Even like the teaching that God wanted to bless us, and He does. And God wants us to have our needs met, and He wants us to have an abundance of things. Why would He want every, all the sinners in the world to have all the good stuff while we sit around and just have nothing all the time? God wants to bless us, but he doesn't want, nor will he bless us beyond our level of spiritual maturity. I guess I better say that again. Think about a tree. First, when a tree is planted, before any fruit comes on the branches, a long time has to be taken for that tree to get deep roots in the ground. Otherwise, when the fruit does come on the branches, the good stuff that you can see, when that comes on the branches, it will cause the whole thing to topple over and fall. If God gives any person more than they are spiritually ready to handle, he's not helping them, he's hurting them. And so don't just pray for God to give you everything you want, pray that God will give you what you can handle. And pray that he will never give you more than what you can handle because stuff can take us away from God if we're not ready to handle it. So the teaching was great. It taught me that God wanted to bless me and I learned how to believe God for greater things than ever before and I learned how to give and I saw a lot of amazing things happening in my life. But if I'm truthful, I think we're still dealing with some of the results of selfishness in Christians that that time in church history caused. People today are addicted to their own comfort. I don't, do you know who Watchman Nee is? Anybody ever heard of him? Well, he's a Chinese Christian that wrote a lot of stuff that you better be ready to grow up before you try to read it. If, if you think I'm straightforward, you ought to read a little bit of his stuff. And I don't necessarily agree with his views on everything, but I learned, I mean, really, his material really helped me see some of the imbalance of some of the things that I believed, because one of the other things that we were taught was that really, if you had enough faith, you wouldn't have to have problems. Well, that's just not biblical. And so when somebody would get sick or somebody would be having problems in their life, back then we always felt like we had to find a reason for it. Well, they must have sin in their life. They must have not had enough faith. And I hate all of that. Hate all of that. Just because you're having problems, that doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. The Bible says that the righteous will suffer and we can't always figure that out, but there's no promise in the word that we're gonna always have everything coming up roses all the time. 
What God does promise us is that he will do the best thing for us at the time, but he also sometimes wants to use us to be a blessing to other people. Is anybody home today in the house? You know, I don't know what it is you want to hear every time you go to church, but I, one of the things that Watchman Nee said that I really liked is he said, we, we, we don't go to church to be entertained. And I, I can tell you, I can tell you from running conferences and we get in these big arenas and you have thousands and thousands of people come and not everybody, but people want to show. And when you're in this position, you, it's heartbreaking sometimes when you really want to get in deeper with somebody and teach them how to grow up in God and how to really serve God and all, all they want you to do is entertain them. And so keep in mind, every time you go to church, you don't have to be entertained. You don't even have to like what the preacher's saying. That doesn't mean you don't need it just because you don't like it. We don't go to church to be entertained. We go to grow up. Amen? I think that every time we go to church, we should hear something that encourages us and convicts us. Something that makes us feel better and something that makes us want to grow and go on. So I thank God for what I learned about faith. But the thing that I'm trying to get across to you today is you can be a great man or a great woman of faith, and that doesn't mean that you are never going to have problems. It doesn't mean that you're always going to get everything the way that you want it. I think it takes one level of faith to believe God and get what you want, but this is my opinion. I think it takes a greater faith to believe God for what you want and not get it and still love God just as much. So let me just say, if you're mad at God today, you're mad at the wrong person. Because he is not the author and source of your problems, the enemy is. Amen? And the only way to get the devil back is to do as much good as you can possibly do every day of your life. I can tell you that every time I get up on the pulpit and I open my mouth to preach a sermon, I'm getting the devil back for what he did to me in my childhood. And every time Pastor Charles gets up and he ministers the word, and I know you're starting a satellite church now, and him and his children are going to be involved in that, do you have any idea how mad it makes the devil when he throws his greatest punch and you just take it to another level? We're going to keep going on with God. Trust is a belief in someone or something a belief that they're reliable, good, honest, and effective. Now, got a whole bunch of stuff I can't get to. So here's a question. What if I don't get what I want? <laughs> hmm. Well, better have a backup plan, I guess. <laughs> See, that's our problem sometimes. We don't, we don't get all the way in with God. We just get in far enough that if he don't come through, we can still take over and find a way to get what we want. That fear of not getting what we want keeps us from totally trusting God. Totally trusting God. Well, what if I totally trust God and I don't get what I want? Well, then I guess you weren't supposed to have it. You know, somewhere along the line, we have to realize that we don't know everything and everything we want may not be the best thing for us and another thing that I think we need to remember is we're not the only planet, person on the planet that God's interested in doing anything with and for. He, he doesn't make all of his decisions just based on what I want, but he makes his decisions based on a lot of things. You know, Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He didn't, he didn't want to go through what he was going to go through. You know, we don't have to want to do everything that we do. We just have to know it's the will of God and be willing to do it. Father, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. Well, you know what? The father didn't enjoy watching his son suffer like that. 
He may have preferred to save him from it, but he didn't because that wasn't all he needed to consider. When Jesus was dying on the cross, you know what the father was thinking about? Yes, he saw the suffering that his son was going through, but you know what he was thinking about? You and me and all the millions of people that would ever live that had to have a savior. Come on. Maybe when I was that little 10 or 12 year old girl and I was praying for God to get me out of that situation, maybe he had uh, all the other millions of women that would be sexually abused in mind and he wanted somebody that would be bold enough to get up in a pulpit and tell them. See, for, for years and years and years, one of the reasons why my mother didn't help me in the situation I was in was because she couldn't face the scandal. Nobody talked about sexual abuse. Nobody talked about incest in families. You just didn't talk about it. You didn't tell anybody and you didn't talk about it. Well, I, somebody needed to talk about it and God picked me. But I had to know what I was talking about. And of course now, people talk about it all the time. It's just, it's out there and people are getting the help that they need. But when you're asking God to do something, he, he doesn't just always just have you in mind. There may be things involved that you just don't understand yet. We live life forward, but we understand it backward. And what you don't understand now, you may understand at some point, but you may never understand, and that's okay too. Amen? Amen. Romans eleven thirty three 33, and 34. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unfathomable, inscrutable, and unsearchable are his judgments, his decisions. And how untraceable, mysterious, undiscoverable are his ways, his methods, his plans. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has understood his thoughts or who has ever been his counselor? So if I would have walked in here today and if I would have said, how many of you uh, are in a time of confusion right now in your life, uh, there would have been a lot of hands up. <laughs> and you know what? You can't get confused if you refuse to get into reasoning. That's the only thing that confuses us is when we try to figure things out that only God knows and he's not ready to tell yet. So how about if we get comfortable not knowing? <laughs> hmm. Come on, I already told you, don't make me work hard. How about if we get comfortable not knowing? How about if we trust God so much that we don't have to know? Well, I hope there's some people watching by television that you're getting this. How about if you just don't have to know? <laughs> See, I think that's what real trust is. I don't have to know. Because God knows. And I trust that he will take care of me. Why, God, why? When, God, when? How, God, how? Come on. How about if we just stop all that and have a, a whole bunch of peace and a bunch of joy? Well, we all need to come to the place where we can be comfortable not knowing everything in life, but instead trusting God in everything. Trust is something that we all want to be stronger in in our relationship with God. And many of you have shared your questions on trust with us. We wanna take some of the time right now and answer some of those questions today. Well, Ginger, did anybody have a question about how to trust God? So many good <laughs> ones, so many good ones. and. I, I wanna ask you about this topic in particular because you've said that you feel this really is the topic that answers nearly all of our questions and, and issues in life, being able to trust God. Why yeah. is this so important to you? Well, somebody asked me recently how 
I could trust God or even expect people to trust God when there's so many things in the world and even in our own lives right. that don't make any sense. Things that and seem unfair. And that's how most of these questions yeah. are exactly. Things that seem unfair and unjust. And first of all, nobody has all those answers. Only God has all of them. But I think I've kind of come to the conclusion that I really only have two options. And I think really we all do. We can either go crazy, just be frustrated and upset all the time, worried, tormented, fretting, anxious, or we can trust God. And after trying both, I've decided that trusting God is better. You know, whatever our lives hold, we do need to try to enjoy them as much as we possibly can. And when we have a problem that we cannot solve, the only really viable option is to give it to the person who can solve it, which is God. Yeah. I do want to say before I try to answer any of these questions, that talking about trusting God is much easier than doing it when you're the one with the problem. Right. And what I'm going to suggest that people do, I have to do myself on a regular basis when I have things come up. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, here's a question from Kimberly in Philadelphia. She says, how do I let go of the fear associated with giving every aspect over to God? I love Him so much and want Him to be over all aspects of my life and trust Him. So I decide to surrender it, but that fear can be just physical. Well, and I understand that. You know, fear actually does bring physical symptoms. And a scripture that I go back to is where David said, the psalmist David, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. Mm. So he didn't even say that he didn't have fear. He didn't say that he didn't feel fear, but he was honest with God about it and said, I feel afraid. You know, I have to talk my way through things sometimes. You know, Lord, I know this fear is ridiculous. Trusting that God is good is a big thing for it me. It is, yeah. You know, that, that God is good. I mean, He just, He is inherently good. He can't do anything that's not good. Yeah. And so we want to control things because we want them to turn out the way we want them to. But to be honest, sometimes what we think we want is not even really what we want. And so I don't think we have to be so concerned about I'm feeling fear as, it, as we do about not letting that fear control us. You know, I teach a lot about fear and that, that, that fear, we're always going to feel fear from time to time, but courage is doing what you know you should do when fear is present. Right. And also your thoughts, you know, anytime that, I mean, all of our feelings are connected to our thoughts. It amazes me how true that is. And I find it more and more all the time. So if we can, I think sometimes we think about our problems too much, Ginger. Mm -hmm. We just, we get it on our mind and we think about it and think about it and think oh, about it. it just gets think stuck it. like a loop. And it's it just so gets hard to stuck. Stop. And so then it's hard to get rid of the emotions. Yeah. And so all I can say to this uh, lovely woman is we're all fighting the same fight together. That's right. But we're not going to let fear win. Yeah. Good. Okay. Eric would like to know, um, I know as head knowledge that I can trust God. I believe his word to be true, and I know that he has come through for me in a lot of ways, but I don't always feel it. Mm -hmm. I know that my feelings don't always tell me the truth, but am I really trusting God when I'm still worried anyway? Well, I think that trusting God, sometimes you have to fight the good fight of faith. And there's basically, sometimes we all feel like two people. You know, we have this spiritual side of us that is trusting God and believing the Word, and then we have the natural side of us, which our enemy Satan plays on, which is done by dumping foolish things in our head that then cause our feelings to go haywire. Yeah. So, I, yes, I think that you can have some of those issues and still be trusting God. Trust is a decision, and sometimes I'll just tell God, you know, I can, I can decide to put my trust in you, but I can't do anything about my feelings. Only you can do something about that. So I have a teaching, uh, actually a book called Living Beyond Your Feelings. And you know, even just myself in the last couple of weeks, I've had to do that on several occasions. You know, you can't, I think the key is to not let the way you feel control you. Mm -hmm. to, to, to believe what the Word says. And here again, just be honest with God. This is the way I feel. Yeah. But I know my feelings don't always tell me the truth. I'm putting my trust in you. 
and I believe you're gonna work things out. And you know, a, another thing about trusting God that I think probably answers a lot of these questions is that he said, I, my mind tells me I can trust God, but my feelings tell me something different. I believe that the more experience we have with God, the easier it is to trust God. I find Very it true. much easier now to trust God than I did 40 years when I first started my journey with God. And I find that people who have been through difficult things and, and you know, we all find out eventually that we do come out okay on the other side. Mm -hmm. When I think about the things that I've been through in the past and, and how frightening they were and yet I'm still here, I'm still serving God, He did work them out. God is good and if we just don't give up, we'll get to where we need to be. Yeah, I think what you said is very reassuring that he is trusting. We, we are trusting even when we feel these yeah. questions. That, you know, like David said, what time God I am understands. afraid, I will put my trust in Right. You. Trust as is not something. As long as we keep it there. Yeah, you, you put it in him. It's a decision yeah. that you make. I will trust the Lord. All right, well, Shawnee says, I believe in God and I know he can do all things, but my trust issues are so deep that I do not wait on God. I try to fix things myself, even though I know better. How can I learn to trust God fully? Well, our little flesh is just so full of energy. It just always wants something to do. It seems like we have this little record playing in our head. That's what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah, how can I fix and, this? Uh, here again, I think experience with God, learning, to be honest, sometimes the more we do, the more length of time we add to how long we're going to have our problem. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm yeah. very, my flesh is very full of energy and I'm the type of person that would always like to find something to do and, and not always nearly as patient as I should be. And you really can just make the mess worse. And so here again, it's just growing. It's, it's learning. And you know how we learn? Mostly we learn by our mistakes. I was reading a book about how to hear from God and he said the biggest question I'm always asked is, how do we hear from God? How do we learn to hear from God? He said, you learn by making mistakes. Yeah. And so here again, the, every time you get involved in something with, that you should be leaving alone and you see that you just made the mess worse, <laughs> then the next time it gets a little bit easier to say, you know what, as hard as it is, I'm going to stay out of that and I'm going to wait on you yeah. to do what needs to be done. But waiting's hard. It is hard. It's hard, but and it's harder for some of us than others. Yeah. My husband Let seems, me just say for me. My husband hard. seems to love it. I don't know. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. I can see Dave, that. Dave, Mr. <laughs> laid back patient Dave, he's like, "Well, we'll see." And I'm like, "I don't want to wait and see. I want to know now. I want to know what's going to happen." So. Yeah. Okay. Sam asked this question. How can you put all of your trust in the Lord when you are so full of scars, especially when those scars cause you to create walls that you don't allow anyone, including the Lord, to break down? Well, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of uh, experience with God. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what he's gone through, but I know that I was abused by my dad growing up and I had all those walls and all those issues mm -hmm. and it, takes time for the soul to be healed. And the more that, that each yeah. time you take a chance and trust God, which you're really not taking a chance when you trust God, but you feel like you are. You feel like you're saying, well, if I trust you and you don't come through, then what? But really, I think a, a, a root of our problem is we're afraid we're not gonna get what we want. Hmm. What if what God wants is not what I want? Yeah. So it really comes That's down really to a, it really comes down to a control issue. And people that have been hurt like I was raised by parents who obviously didn't care about me. They cared more about what they wanted than what I wanted. And then I married when I was 18 years old, the first guy that showed any interest in me and he didn't you know, by the time you've had a lot of years of everybody taking advantage of you, mm -hmm. even though you may want to trust this good heavenly father that you're hearing about, it takes time to come to the point where you, I remember God told me one time, you just need to retire from self-care and throw yourself a big retirement party. Wow, so yeah. we, we spend so much time trying to take care of ourselves, not realizing that God can do a much better job if we'll let him. None of this is easy. Nobody has any easy answers to trusting God. But like I said, I've come to the point where that really is my only viable option if I want to have any peace at all is to trust God. 
Well, you said that you've tried it both ways and you mm -hmm. found that trusting is the one that really works. What is it about God's character? What is it about what He does in your life that makes that trust pay off? Well, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things about God's character and it's, it's such an amazing thing to study, the character of God. God is good, He's merciful, He's kind. But you know, one of the things, if I was just gonna talk about one thing that is one of my favorite things about God's character that really helps me in trusting God is that God is a God of justice. Mm. And that means that He always makes wrong things right. Mm. That's great. Don't you love that? I do. He all, so if somebody treats me wrong, I can either try to go get them back, I can try to talk them into treating me right, which is useless, or I can trust God to be my vindicator and it may take a while. It may not happen when I want it to. It may not happen the way I want it to. It may not even happen through the person I would like it to happen through. Mm -hmm. But God is a God of justice, and He will always take wrong things and make them right. And no matter what has happened to us, if we put our trust in God, even though it's challenging, if we put our trust in Him, ultimately, He will vindicate us, and He is our rewarder. We've had a good start. Last night we talked about dealing with doubt. This morning we talked about a lot of foundational and basic things about trusting God, especially in our challenges in life and not spending all of our time trying to figure things out. And so this afternoon I want to get into some of the reasons why we suffer, although we cannot always figure it out. There are some things that we can learn. But first I want to say that you're never gonna trust anybody if you don't believe that they're trustworthy. And so, in order to trust God, we need to know more about God's character. Studying the character of God is a very good thing to do, and it's actually something that I really love to preach on. One of the, one of the main things about God is that God is good. You know, if you can't figure anything else out, the devil's bad and God is good. Amen. Amen? We can do that. And God said, I set before you life and death, good and evil. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. Now, God is, of course, sovereign and he can do anything he wants to anytime he wants to. But when God gave man free choice, he opened up the door for sin to come into the world through making wrong choices. God did not want a bunch of robots that loved him and obeyed him because they had to. He wanted us to make right choices. And so we want to get into the question this afternoon that so many people have and especially people that maybe um, are on the fringe, they're kind of looking for a reason not to believe in God, they're looking for a reason not to serve God, uh, but also this can get into the hearts and minds of believers, and that is, well, if God is good and he can be trusted, then why do we have so much suffering in the world today? Why do bad things happen to good, godly people? Joyce, does God cause suffering? I get asked these questions. Well, if he doesn't cause it, does he allow it? If he's sovereign and he can do anything, then why doesn't he stop child abuse and disease and world hunger and things like that? Why do little children suffer with cancer? Why do the good sometimes die young while mean people live to be old? Why did I lose my job and all my retirement? Why did my child die when I were praying for them to be healed? You know, why can almost drive a person to insanity if they can't come to terms with it? And one of the things that we tried to make very clear this morning is we need to get comfortable not knowing. And if you weren't here this morning, I wanna make sure that you get to hear that. And even if you were here, I want you to hear it again. We need to get comfortable not knowing because that's part of serving God is even when we don't know, he does. 
And there's, if we have all the answers, there's no reason to trust God. You understand that? If we have all the answers, the, only, well, the one thing that makes God God is we don't know what he knows. If we ever knew as much as he did, then we wouldn't need him. We'd have it all figured out. So you're never going to have all the answers. You're always going to have unanswered questions. And there will be things happen in your life and to other people that you just cannot wrap your brain around. And you're going to have to get comfortable saying, well, God, I don't know the answer, but I trust you. And I trust that if and when I need that answer, that you'll give it to me. So if I try to answer these questions and others like it, if you were to come to me and ask me all those questions, here's what I would have to say to you. I don't know. <laughs> and I think one of the biggest mistakes that teachers and preachers make is trying to answer questions that they really don't know the answer to. Because they think they gotta sound smart. And to tell you the truth, I don't have the answer to all these things. I mean, there's some answers that I could give and I am gonna give you some reasons this afternoon why people suffer. If there are things that we can do about it, then we should do it. We can learn from our mistakes and make some changes. But I don't have all those answers. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that I know that I know that God is good. Amen. I know that. And just because bad things happen, that certainly is not an invitation for us to blame God. The reason why bad things happen is because of sin in the world. It's not necessarily our own personal sin. It can be. To be honest, sometimes we have trouble in our life just because we do stupid stuff. Can anybody just agree with me on that? I mean, sometimes we just, I mean, how much better would life be, for example, if we just followed peace? I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. How many times do we make bad choices and then when we get ourselves in trouble, we want God to get us out of it, and then if he doesn't, we're getting mad at him and if we backtrack, we didn't do what he told us to to start with. Now, that doesn't mean that we lose our relationship with God. That doesn't even necessarily mean that he's mad at us. But we do have to take a fresh look today at what the Bible says about if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh ruin, decay, and destruction. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap from the Spirit life and life eternal. You see, God loves us, and that is not based on anything we do or don't do. And when we get ourselves in trouble, it hurts God more than it even hurts us. Let me tell you something. If you have a child that's in trouble, I heard an interesting statement. I believe it. A mother is never any happier than her most unhappy child. Let me tell you, when your kids are hurting, you would rather take it on yourself than to watch them go through the things that they go through. And especially if it's because of their own bad choices, you're just like, I just want to open up your head and cram the truth in you, and I don't know why you just won't listen. But sometimes we just have to stand back and let them find out for themselves. And sometimes that's what God has to do with us. He tells us what to do. If we don't do it, he still loves us. But there is a principle at work in the earth from Genesis all the way through to the end of time. And that is, is that if you sow a good seed, you're gonna get a good result. And if you sow a bad seed, you're gonna get a bad result. So yes, some of our problems are the result of our own sin. But when I have trouble, when I have problems in my life, I've got a good enough relationship with God that I can go to him and say, is there something I did that opened the door for this? Because I want to learn. If I'm, you know, sometimes, sometimes I can act dumb and I don't know that I'm acting dumb. Sometimes I've done something that, you know, God needs to show me. Because to be honest, sometimes we do things and, and we do them so quick that we don't even really realize that we did them. One night I was having a real hard time sleeping. And I wish I would have asked God this question sooner, but I waited till 5 a.m after tossing and turning all night. God, what's wrong? <laughs> 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 
And I mean, just like that, he showed me somebody that I was rude to the day before. And I just, that happened so quick and I just glossed over it so fast. Didn't even remember that I did it. And it really was something I needed to go and apologize to that person for. And that wasn't going to happen if God didn't reveal to me what I had done. And so in his goodness, everybody say goodness. In his goodness, he was disturbing my sleep until I got smart enough to say, what's going on here? And he showed me not to make me feel bad, but so I could go and take care of it. So it's smart sometimes to just say, God, did I open a door here? Is there something that I've done that you need to show me? If he doesn't show you anything, then don't go on a digging expedition trying to find out what your sin was that caused you to have problems in your life. Can you hear me today? That is the worst thing in the world to do. Well, God must be punishing me or I must have done something wrong. You know what? God will let you know if there's something you need to see. And if he doesn't show you, then you don't need to try to figure it out. Can anybody say amen? amen. And so um, sometimes our own sin causes our problems. Many times the sin of other people causes us pain and unhappiness. It was not my sin that caused my father to sexually abuse me. It was his sin. And I just was there and got hurt by it. It was my mother's passivity and her refusing to do her duty and do anything about it that caused my pain. And yes, that's unjust. And yes, that's unfair. But here's the good news. Once a person is old enough to start making their own choices, my father's bad choices hurt me. And I wish that God would have got me out of it, but he didn't. However, as soon as I was old enough to start making my own choices, every good choice that I made started reversing the results of every bad choice that he made. Did you hear me? So instead of spending the rest of your life being mad and bitter because somebody didn't treat you right, and spending all your life trying to figure out why, why don't you just leave all that with God and trust him to do something else that I know that he does, and that is he works good out of anything in our life, no matter how bad it was, if we trust him to do it. So two things I know about God. God is good. The devil's bad. God is good. And no matter what happens in our life, if we trust God, he will take it and work something good out of it for our benefit. It doesn't have to be good for God to get good out of it. Amen? And so, my dad hurt me, just like many of you have been hurt, many of you have been mistreated, and chances are you may be again. You know, we're in the world and there's a lot of mean people out there that are very selfish and self-centered, and to be honest, we hurt other people too sometimes and we don't even know that we did it, or it's maybe on a day when we really just don't care all that much because we're going through something ourselves, and we're not being sensitive to the way other people feel. And so everything doesn't always go the way that we want it to go in our life, but that doesn't make God bad. So we can suffer because of our own sin. We can suffer because of somebody else's sin. Or a lot of times, and this is just a lot of it, we just suffer because of the sin principle that's in the world. I mean, they're just, I don't even think that we can imagine the difference there will be in the atmosphere of heaven compared to the atmosphere that we live in here. I don't think we even understand the pressure that we're under and the oppression that's around us. Let me tell you something. If you worked in some worldly profession and you work with a lot of people that are unbelievers and a lot of gossip, a lot of criticism, a, a, a lot of complaining and murmuring and grumbling and fault finding and you know a lot of people that were out drunk the night before and now they're at work and they're mad because they didn't get any sleep and so on and so forth. If you worked there for five years and you came to work for me, 
I mean, one of the things I tell our employees, and they all recognize this, just the atmosphere. Because every place you work, there's a culture. And so we have built a culture in the Joyce Meyer ministry of being positive and, and being able to trust each other and, and happy people. And we don't put up with strife. If you're going to work for me and you're going to cause strife, you're not going to work there very long. Because you cannot have strife and also have success. Amen? And, and one of the things that Pastor Mike Shepherd does is, is he does rotating teachings in the departments on our core values at Joyce Meyer Ministries, which is if you're going to do it, do it, with, do it right or don't do it at all. Be an excellent person because God is excellent. Be a person of integrity. Keep your word. Do what you say you're going to do. Use wisdom with God's money, the money that he gives us. We don't waste it. We use wisdom with it. And we keep the strife out of our personal lives, and we keep the strife out of the ministry. There is no basis for me to ask God to bless my ministry if I'm not going to do those basic things that he asks us to do. Let me tell you something. So many homes are full of strife. I mean, you can come to church and put a smile on your face, get your church face out when you hit the parking lot. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And we're so happy, yappy, yappy, happy. And get in the car and fight all the way back home. Well, that's, you know. <laughs> come on. I know. Dave and I used to do it. We did it for years. fight all the way to church. I mean, I can remember standing in the, right down here where Pastor Charles is sitting, that was my seat at the church that I went to years ago, and I can remember having my hands lifted up, mouthing the words on the overhead, thinking, if Dave thinks I'm cooking him anything to eat today, he's got another thing coming. I bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Boop, boop, boop. Come on, how many of you know that song? Yeah. Now go and hug somebody and tell them you love them with the love of the Lord. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if we go home and he turns that stupid football game on one more time, one more Sunday, there's going to be trouble in the house. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a bunch of phony, baloney religion. It's not, I mean, all we're doing is throwing the door wide open to the enemy and things like that. And so there's, there's just our own sin. There's the sin of other people. There's just the sin principle in the world. And so we just, we don't even begin to realize. I mean, I just can't, I mean, I, I don't want to leave before my time, but I can't wait to get to heaven and just see how wonderful it's going to be to not hurt anywhere, amen, nowhere. <laughs> I walk five miles a day, and that's one of the things that helps me stay strong. And, and um, my daughter came over to walk with me a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday, and Something was bothering her. Something was hurting her. And she said, how are you today? You know, because I've, in the last three years, I've had both hips replaced. And, you know, it's so great today. If you wear something out, you can just get a replacement part. I mean, they just, man, they can replace everything today. I mean, you can get your shoulder replaced, your ankle replaced, your knees replaced. Man, you can get heart transplants. It's just pretty cool. You know, you just. However, when our time's up, <laughs> there's nothing we can do about it. But anyway, so, you know what I mean? I've had back problems different times in my life, so on and so forth. So, you know, yada, yada, that's just part of life. And so she, something was hurting her, and she mentioned it, and she said, um, how, how are you today? Is everything okay? I said, oh, I don't know. Some, you know, it's always something, one thing or another. I don't pay any attention to it. I just keep on going. And so we don't even know what it's going to be like to have a glorified body and to not have anything that hurts or anything that bothers us and to be in an atmosphere of total and complete love and trust. So let me tell you something. 
It's a little harder to live in this world and be happy than what we might think it is sometimes just because of all the junk going on around us. Can anybody say amen to that? I mean, if you watch television today, you better do it with a remote control in your hand so you can fast forward past all the stuff that you don't want to poison your soul. Thank you for your good response. So there's a lot of different reasons why things happen to us, and we can ask God for some explanation for some things, but we're not ever going to get the answer to all those things. So, say God is good. The devil's bad. <laughs> and God works good out of anything if we trust him. How many of you believe that and you've experienced that in your life? Man, I've seen that over and over and over and over. Okay, let's talk about some reasons why we suffer. How many of you want to at least eliminate some of the things if you can? Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Thank God in everything. <laughs> wow. No matter what the circumstances might be, be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus the revealer and the mediator of that will. You know, being thankful for what we do have really helps us get through the times when we don't have what we'd like to have. I'm going to say it again. Being thankful for what we do have helps us make it through the times when it's difficult because we have needs that are not being met yet. Our words of gratitude, I wrote this down and I colored it in because I said it and I like it. <laughs> Our words of gratitude in the face of suffering, especially unjust suffering, are a stronger proof of our trust in God more than any other thing that I know of. When you're going through something unjust, unfair, unkind, it's just not right, and you can still thank God on those days and really mean it, that's a very strong proof that you have your trust in God. Psalm 103.20 says that angels hearken to the word of God. They don't hearken to our complaining. You've got a lot of angels that you could put to work in your life by just complaining a lot less and giving a lot more thanks. We're all so much more blessed than what we think that we are many times. A wise man suffers much less than a fool. <laughs> Proverbs 18, six and seven. I'm gonna talk to you for a minute about our words. A self-confident fool's lips bring contention and his mouth invites a beating. <laughs> You know, that, that's actually just worth reading again. <laughs> a self-confident fool's lips bring contention, starts arguments, starts fights, causes strife, causes problems. How many times have you said something dumb? Or if I saw, I'll just blame it on me. How many times have I said something dumb? Because I know you don't do that. And I've just started some big ordeal with somebody and just thought later, why didn't I just keep my mouth shut? It's so hard for us to just keep our mouth shut. I often say, God gave us two ears and one mouth. That must mean we're supposed to listen more than we talk, but we fail to do that. Proverbs 12, 18. There are those who speak rashly. That means they just say whatever floats around in their head and they don't really give any thought to what they're about to say. There are those who speak rashly like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Isn't that good? Proverbs 18, 21. The power of life and death is in the tongue. <laughs> and get this, and those who indulge it must eat the fruit of it. Uh-oh. Come on, I'm not making this up. This is real stuff. You know, I didn't know this. I was a Christian for many years, and nobody told me this. And I don't care how many times you've heard messages about the power of your words. 
you're going to get a little refresher course this afternoon. Because we still, it's one of the areas that we have one of the biggest problems with is we just say a bunch of dumb stuff and then we get in trouble and we're mad at God because he's not fixing it. We have to be especially careful how we talk when we're under pressure. How we talk when things aren't going the way we want them to go. In John 14, 30, I love this. What a lesson this is. It was getting close to the time when Jesus was going to begin to go into his suffering in Gethsemane and and he was trying to convey to the disciples some of the things that were getting ready to happen. And in John 14, 30, he said, I'm not going to talk with you much more after this because the wicked one is coming and he has no part in me. Now, what are we going to make out of that other than Jesus said, look, what's going on right now is really important. The decisions that I make now, there's a lot based on these decisions. And so even Jesus in his humanity decided that he was going to just be quiet during his time of suffering because he did not want to open a door for the enemy that would give him any access to anything that was going on. How many of you think sometimes when you're going through trouble, you'd just be so better off to just go lock yourself in a room somewhere and just not say anything to anybody? Oh, we're not done with you yet. We still got tonight to go. <laughs> and then I love this in, in uh, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he was submissive and he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now, how many years did I read those scriptures and I didn't have a clue what that meant? And I think it means exactly what it says. When Jesus was under pressure, he kept quiet. Because although he was God, he also was man. And do you know, he was a, a God man and that's what the Bible calls him. And you know what? That's exactly what we are today. You're a God man or a God woman. You have a human flesh, but God lives in you. And the Holy Spirit is in you, guiding you and directing you. And he's in me, guiding me and directing me. If we would just slow down just a little bit. And just when the Lord says, keep quiet. Just keep quiet. How many of you think, how many of you agree with me that you could change a lot of things in your life if you just change some of the stuff you say? Okay, so then... It's not God's fault, is it? <laughs> a wise man has a lot better things going on in his circumstances than a foolish man does. Another thing that we should not do, that we do, just trying to be real practical here this afternoon, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 1 and 2, do not judge and criticize and condemn other people. Well, well, well. Has anybody managed to get to, I don't know, what time is it? 2.30 something, I have no idea. Has anybody managed to get to this time of the day and you haven't judged or criticized anybody yet? <laughs> I don't know, you may have had some opinions about me already today. <laughs> and I'm up here trying to help you. Well, that's the second outfit she's had on today. Well, I'm going to have another one on tonight, so you should come back and see that one. And you know what? I'm not trying to impress you with my many outfits, but if I wore the same thing all day today, I can tell you something you don't know. I would have the same thing on on TV for six days in a row. So poor me, I have to shop for TV. What a burden I carry. And you know what? Here's the other side of it. If you're jealous because I got more than two outfits, then 
man, you need to watch my program four times a day. <laughs> we have so many opinions about what everybody else does. And we get so caught up in what we think other people should do when our own lives are much more of a mess than theirs are. And if you don't need this, I'll preach to me because I'm pretty opinionated. <laughs> Do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned. Okay, so when you hear that somebody's been talking about you, <laughs> boy, it makes you mad. But let me ask you a question. Are they sowing a bad seed or are you reaping off of a bad seed that you sowed in somebody else's life? <laughs> Some of you didn't even get that. We'll make another pass at it. <laughs> if we gossip and judge and criticize other people, then the Bible says that's what we're going to get back. So we're so quick to do that. And I really wasn't kidding when I said, has anybody made it till 2 o'clock this afternoon and you haven't judged or criticized anybody yet? Chances are... There's not too many in here that have. And so we do it so much, to be honest, we don't even really see the problem with it. It's just like we just think that's fine to just try to run everybody else's life. <laughs> well, let me just throw this out. I haven't got to say this for a while. You know what? You can improve your life a lot if you just mind your own business. Man, we get involved in other people's stuff, and it's just so silly. We have so many opinions about what other people should and shouldn't do. Save yourself a lot of trouble and just mind your own business. And if you really feel like that somebody's doing something that's against the Word of God, pray for them and don't go tell somebody else what they're doing. <laughs> Come on, this is just good, plain Bible teaching. And so, here's the thing. The devil's not just looking for an open door in your life. He's looking for any little tiny crack he can crawl through. And the more opportunity you have to do things for God, the narrower your path is going to become. Can I tell you something? There might be things that you could do and you wouldn't have the same repercussion that I would if I did it because of what I'm doing and what I'm teaching. The Bible says, don't let many of you become teachers because there will be much greater condemnation for those that are telling other people what to do if they don't do it. When I stand up here and tell everybody else how they should run their lives, my path gets narrower and narrower and narrower. The Bible says in Matthew 7, stay on the narrow path that leads to life and off the broad path that leads to destruction. And I remember one time murmuring to God, like, well, you know, I just feel like my path gets narrower and narrower all the time. He said, that's right. There's no room on it for your fleshly baggage, so just drop it. <laughs> you know, we want to have all the privilege and still do dumb stuff, and that's just not going to work. Now, none of this means God doesn't love us. He loves us. But nonetheless, a parent who loves us is not going to stand by and just let us do all kinds of goofy stuff and not bring any kind of correction in our life. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises. And in Revelation, it says, be enthusiastic when God shows you your faults. In the Amplified Bible, in Revelation 3, so be enthusiastic and full of zeal when God shows you your faults because it's just a sign of his love. Well, sometimes I've thought, could you love me a little less? Maybe go love Dave a little more. <laughs> Wouldn't you like it sometimes if God just loved your spouse a little more than he loves you and tell them what's wrong with them instead of it always being you? <laughs> Come on, I got to have fun at this part if you want me to make it through tonight. Don't judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. 
For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure that you use when you deal out to others, it will be dealt back out to you. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived and deluded. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that and that only is what he shall reap. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh ruin, decay, and destruction. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap from the spirit life and life eternal. Now, let me give you an example concerning the words of your mouth. I believe that when we talk the way we're supposed to, being careful not to be critical and downgrading of other people and being more careful about just saying negative things, I think it adds to our joy. I think we just have happier days. You know, the Bible says a man has joy in making a right and an apt answer. And I also believe that sometimes when people are depressed and they're just having a bad day and they just feel all down, they're like, I don't know what's wrong, I just got a heaviness, and yeah, got to rebuke the devil. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's caused just by the way we talk. Come on, you're not going to go to church on Sunday, sit at the lunch table at work on Monday, and gossip about everybody at the office, and then go home and feel happy. We're in the world, we're not of it. You don't get to act like everybody else. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. We're having fun. <laughs> okay, now, a person can do everything right, though, and still suffer. <laughs> First Peter 2, 19 and 20 are some scriptures that I just really wish were not in here. <laughs> but they are. For one is regarded favorably is approved and acceptable and thankworthy if, as in the sight of God, he endures the pain of unjust suffering. <laughs> After all, what kind of glory is there in it if when you do wrong and you're punished for it, you take it patiently? But if you bear patiently with suffering, which results when you do right, and that is undeserved, now this is acceptable and pleasing to God. And I wrote out beside that scripture, very painful. What kind of a God is it that would be happy if I'm suffering unjustly? It doesn't really say that he's happy if we suffer unjustly. It says he's happy if we keep a good attitude when we suffer unjustly. Come on, let's don't misread it. He says, look, anybody can have a good attitude if things are going their way. But when you're suffering, when you're doing right, when you're on your best behavior and you're the one serving God and you give offerings and you walk in the fruit of the Spirit and, and you help other people and now you, the wrong things are happening to you, God is pleased as even in those times if we keep a good attitude and we hold our temper. I'm going to tell you something that I learned a long time ago and I think this would be up on the top part of the list of some of the things that God's given me to say to people that I think are important and very helpful. In Galatians, it says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And we don't know what that due season is. It's whatever time God feels is the right time in our life. And there are times when God will let things go on longer than we would like them to go on because for whatever reason, you know, he's doing something in us, he's doing something in somebody else. But I want you to remember what I'm getting ready to say. When you can keep doing what's right while you're still not yet getting the right result, you're growing spiritually. Can I give you a secret? When you're growing spiritually, it usually really hurts. <laughs> Amen? Amen? A lot of things that feel good may feel good, but they don't really maybe help us all that much. 
But I can tell you sometimes when you're going through really, really hard stuff, stuff like Pastor Charles and his family went through, stuff like I've gone through, stuff like you've gone through, even though you decide to trust God, you can have a pain in your soul that you just sometimes feel like you just can't stand. And one of the things that I've come to realize is it's almost like I can feel that digging a deeper place in my soul for God to come and reside in. You're never alone in your suffering. And when you trust God in your times of suffering, they will never be wasted. Because God will take them and he will work something good out of them and he will make you a better person than what you ever thought that you might possibly be. Amen. How many of you could say right now that you are the person you are because of some of the painful things that you've gone through in your life? I mean, I absolutely have to say that. The things that I've gone through is part of what has qualified me to help you. You know, all we got to do is look at Jesus. It says that the things that he went through, this is in Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. But how could you learn obedience when you're never disobedient? Well, he learned the cost of obedience. And you know, obedience is costly. When you do the right thing when it doesn't feel right, there's a pain involved in that. And we do that because we love God. The reward may come later, but right now I'm doing this. I'm doing the hard thing because I love God. And then in the Amplified Bible, in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, it says that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered and his completed experience equipped him. Our experience equips us. His experience equipped him to become the author and the source of our salvation. I preached a message earlier this year in a few places and I really enjoyed it called The Value of Experience. You know, if nothing else, what you're going through right now is giving you experience. And it's going to be something that you can tuck away that nobody can ever take away from you. And one thing is for sure, when you go through something hard and you watch God deliver you and you watch him bring that reward in your life, honey, let me tell you, all the pain that you went through and all the waiting that you went through is worth it when all of a sudden God's reward comes in your life. Amen. Let me tell you something. The people that hurt you will someday have to watch God reward you. <laughs> Amen. First Peter 4, 15 and 16, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or any sort of criminal or a mischief maker and here it comes, are a meddler in the affairs of other people. <laughs> uh -huh. See, you thought I was making that up. It's right here in the Bible. <laughs> Mind your own business. Now, you know the thing that I find interesting with this is all of a sudden we're talking about murderers and thieves and criminals, and in the same sentence, now he talks about not meddling in the affairs of other people. Well, wait a minute, Jesus. I mean, that's not a big thing. I mean, yeah, I may gossip some, and maybe I could mind my own business a little bit more, but I mean, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't rob the gas station. I mean, I'm doing good. No, he's got it all in the same sentence. You know, one of the mistakes that we've made in the church is we have sins... And then we have acceptable sins. <laughs> We've got a whole list of these things that we just get so used to doing 
that we don't even really recognize what they are anymore. And that's why we need to pray, if you're bold enough to pray this, God, I don't want to get by with anything. Come on, how much courage do you have? How much do you want to grow? God, I don't want to get by with anything. I want to be exactly what you want me to be. And if I'm doing things in my life that I'm not seeing, open my blind eyes and unstop my deaf ears. And how does this suit you? And deal with me however you want to. I'm going to preach the rest of this turn backwards. Deal with me however you want to, but don't let me get by with nonsense. Have you been looking for a 365-day devotional? Well, look no further than the Promises for Your Everyday Life devotional from Joyce Meyer. There's a focus verse for all 365 days of the year, along with a prayer starter. Get your copy of Promises for Your Everyday Life devotional at joycemeyer.org slash 365devo. The biggest thing that we need to do is learn how to think like God thinks, and the only way you can do that is by knowing the Word of God. In Words to Live By, Joyce Meyer shares how studying the Word of God transformed her life. Experience a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God through the captivating collection of verses in this beautiful hardcover book by Joyce Meyer. Discover the transformative power of His Word. Words to Live By from Joyce Meyer. Get your YouTube exclusive offer today. Go to joycemeyer.org slash words and the number two. Have you ever been trapped in a never-ending frenzy where every passing moment feels like a blur, leaving you gasping for a chance to pause and catch your breath? In her insightful book, Pursuing Peace, Joyce Meyer explores the importance of seeking peace at all costs. This beautiful hardcover edition is filled with meaningful scriptures and uplifting quotes from Joyce, providing valuable guidance for living a peaceful lifestyle. So grab a cup of coffee, find a comfortable spot, and embark on your journey to find peace. Remember, this limited-time YouTube offer won't last long. Go to joycemeyer.org pursuit to get your copy today and start your pursuit of peace. The mind actually is the battlefield. That's where we win or lose the war with Satan. He said all he gets to say. <laughs> he says, is the rest of the day is mine. You start asking God to heal you and he will restore. He's the God of all comfort. And I am so grateful that I know how to call on God.